Tom's been a great friend, as you can tell, to me and to the environmental movement. Um, I recently read his book, A Lucky Life, Interrupted. And as much as Tom considers his life here to date to have been lucky, after reading this book and witnessing his constant energy, I know that his life going forward, if not lucky, is going to be plucky, showing determined courage in the face of difficulties. Tom is from that greatest generation of news anchors, looking greater and greater these days. We are lucky to have one of them, one of the greatest amongst us tonight, and glad he is in such plucky good health. Tom, I'd like to just have a round of applause for you and your contribution. <clears throat> so tonight, I'm, I'm grateful for two tributes. One, getting the Brokaw seal of approval, which I just got, I guess. But of course, the other being this terrific FPA Association Award, and I wish to thank them for this great honor. I was really thrilled to hear that I was chosen to be the first speaker tonight, and I thought that <clears throat> had you know, special meaning and that there was a special recognition or accolade that was, that was given to me. Until my clever wife pointed out that the awards were probably going to be given out in alphabetical order. <laughs> Thank you, Gabrielle, for setting me straight, as you usually do. So, <clears throat> but all the honorees tonight, in whatever order we're introduced, <clears throat> all feel the same thing, that this is a great organization, and we share the real appreciation for the work that the Foreign Policy Association does. Its mandate of informing, engaging, and inspiring citizens to participate in the foreign policy process over its 97-year history has made a lasting contribution. Because of their achievements and their stellar reputation, I readily agreed to support their task force on climate change report, soon to be released. As someone who believes deeply about informing, engaging, and inspiring others to protect our environment, I cannot imagine a more important or timely report from such an organization. Just yesterday, in fact, the President <clears throat> delivered a commencement speech at the Coast Guard Academy in which he discussed the national security implications of climate change. We cannot, however, depend on studies or speeches alone to spur action on climate change. As well-meaning as the efforts, as good as the science, and as critical the recommendations, we live in a world where governments face extreme political and budgetary constraints. Therefore, it is incumbent upon the private sector to provide whatever impetus we can to focus the government's priorities and to make national policies on climate change a necessity, not a luxury. Now, our foundation has been privileged to support some great environmental movements and join in conservation activist campaigns sometimes with, without, and sometimes against local governments. Although our commitment <clears throat> spans across North America, from New York to Colorado to my home state of North Carolina, we also support international efforts such as Oceans 5 and Oceans Unite, both important initiatives bringing marine conservation to the forefront of our political consciousness. We've worked in Panama with local conservationists to try to stop unregulated and unreported fishing and to curtail logging in the rainforest. And in particular, in the Bahamas, we have supported conservation efforts to save threatened land and marine areas. It's a place I care deeply about, which has felt like a second home for the last 25 years, and one where a U.S. foreign policy on climate change could have a big impact. You know, the Bahamas is the closest non-contiguous, friendly foreign nation to the United States. Yet it is a young and developing country. It's been independent for only 40 years. <clears throat> it's one place where the U.S. foreign policy could give leadership for the Bahamas and other regional powers. The Bahamian government has made great progress in conservation of their spectacular natural resources, committing to protect 20% of their coastal and marine habitats by the end of this decade. They are also working hard to update defenses against illegal fishing and poaching and strengthen oversight of fisheries and aquaculture. But unfortunately, though the, bah <coughs> the, Bahamas does, the Bahamas does not yet have a comprehensive environmental safety net. For instance, there is no Environmental Protection Act to ensure proper governance and regulation. 
Our foundation is supporting lo local efforts that are pushing the government to adopt one, as well as the Freedom of Information Act. Without such legislation, environmentalists are unable to hold accountable those responsible for the common occurrence of oil spills, fouling waters, and developers destroying precious coral reefs. This is an example where a coherent, comprehensive U.S. foreign policy on climate change, such as the one recommended by the FPA's report, would be extremely influential and impactful. So I'd like to conclude where, where I began and simply say thank you very much for this great honor. Thank you to the FPA for, for this award, and thank you especially Tom. And I'd like to congratulate my fellow honorees, whom you'll soon be meeting in whatever order they show up at. Um, we are all proud to receive recognition from an organization that takes this mandate so seriously and allows that mandate to evolve as their task force on climate ch change exhibits in a changing world. That report concludes, complacency is not an option, and I couldn't agree more. Time is of the essence. The great philosopher Voltaire said, men argue, nature acts. It is now our job to make sure the arguments end and that responsible action on climate change moves ahead swiftly. Thank you again.